So you want to know what it's like to be stung by one of the most deadliest and dangerous jellyfish in the entire world? He's about to tell you. <laughs> So some introductions. I'm Savannah and... I'm James. And we have just got back from a pretty eventful six weeks of travelling the east coast of Australia. Um, it was a trip that we've wanted to do for years, like literally pre-Covid we'd booked it. Um, and as soon as the borders opened in mid-February, we booked the flights and we were there like the same day, weren't mm, we? Yeah. Um, we were super eager to go and we went with the conception that we'd be totally fine, just look out for like the snakes, the spiders, and the sharks. And the sharks. What else could go wrong? To set the scene, there we are in our lovely Airbnb in Cairns um, and it's a gorgeous day, like 36 degrees, super hot. Um, and there isn't loads to do in Cairns, I suppose, apart from going to sea. So, we sat down and we researched best, like, family-friendly, just really chill. Just fun beaches, I think, just the best beaches to just, go and visit. Just fun beaches in Cairns. Um, and the number one that pops up was... It's Palm Cove, I think. It's Palm Cove. Up there. And Palm Cove, we'll put a little picture of it here is a stunning beach it really really is and nothing can take away from that you know but there is something not so stunning <laughs> that lurks in the waters that we were just completely unaware of so we arrived um and we'd been to trinity beach which is a beach about 10 minutes away from Palm um, and they're all the Cairns beaches in general they're kind of samey same in the sense that you've got you know the lifeguards tower and then you've got a couple of warning signs and the warning sign for the main one was crocodiles mm, crocs. It was crocodiles. Shop, crocs. Um, and then the second one was stingers and we're obviously British we didn't even really like link jellyfish and stingers together at the start. I mean, obviously we know that now. Um, we thought, oh, like blue bottles, that's, that's not ideal. Um, but then we spoke to the lifeguards and they said, as long as you go swimming in this kind of safe netted area, you should be totally fine. Um, so basically what they do, they, they set up these nets and they're super, super fine, so nothing is meant to be able to fit through them. No crocodiles, no jellyfish, no anything that is going to kill you, basically. Um, so that's what we did. We thought we'll, we'll go swimming in the nets. Um, and there must have been like 20, 25 people swimming with us, wasn't mm, there? Yeah, yeah, everyone was in there. It didn't... Looks inviting. Looked inviting. Looked it? inviting. Um, so I'll put a video up there. This was us literally just having a nice little swim. As I say, it was 36 degrees. So everyone on the beach was in the water. Um, it was absolutely boiling. Even the sea temperature, I think it was like 28 degrees that day. Like it was so warm. Um, and we've later learned that the reason stinger season is between November and May is because they love the warm water um, and also the northerly winds. There's a kind of, you know, contributing factor um, that makes these jellyfish mm. rife in the area. So, all was going well. We were having a nice, you know, swim. We went in for like half an hour, just swam around. Yeah, having a, <laughs> having a great day. We went out, um, we had some pasta, we had some pasta on the beach and then we were like, right, let's go back in for one more swim. And then... I got stung! <laughs> it's probably going to be best if James kind of talks through this because I wasn't stung, fortunately. <clears throat> um, and poor James had to go through everything by himself, pretty much. So, you were in the water. Were you on your own? I was. You were on the edge um, of the water and I was, I was up to my waist. Away. You were catching the tan and I was up to my waist. Um, in the water and all of a sudden there was an electric shock on my arm. So after that I jumped out of the water, had a feeling that something wasn't quite right and uh, had a look down at my arm and there were a couple of 
small lumps and bumps there, just uh, just small marks. So I thought I must have been stung. Um, being the Brit that I am, I quickly thought that in half an hour I could uh, ride out the pain and no one would know and it'd be fine. Um, well the thing is at this point as well we had no idea what kind of jellyfish were in the sea. Oh I didn't have a clue. I so like we were thinking like oh it must be one of those like big blue bottles you know the one that you're meant to like pee on and it stings a Just the standard hour. jellyfish drawing that you'd see I think. But, um, so after that I was out of the water, decided to go and ruin the lifeguard's day by telling him everything that happened. So the lifeguard told me to go away um, and see if the pain gets any worse for a minute or two um, and that's where it did get a lot worse um, quite quickly so I was straight back up to tell him um, all the symptoms I was having and he could tell from that that it was Irukandji which is the type of jellyfish that would have stung me. And when we heard the name Irukandji, I was like, Irrawati? Like it, never. I would be surprised if any Brit, I mean, maybe we're just really ignorant, but if any Brit that maybe didn't study marine biology knew what an Irukandji was, mm. like it just completely went over my head. Um, and he actually told me, he said, on the back of the lifeguard tower, we've got a poster, and I'll insert a picture now, um, of what an Irukandji jellyfish is. And the craziest thing is they are the size of your small fingernail. Mm, they, they are tiny. They are minute. Yeah. But how much venom do they hold? Enough to, well, I think it was something like a thousand times the tarantula, isn't it? And uh... They are the smallest but most venomous animal, fish, whatever, on the planet. So luckily that statistic wasn't on the board because I think I would have passed out at that point. Um, but the lifeguard, he said to me, you're not going to want to be near James for the next however long, he said, because this particular jellyfish, the Irukandji, releases, the poison that it releases into James's body sets off a feeling of impending doom, like a chemical reaction. Um, so it's not just the pain, you think, God, this is so painful, I'm going to die. It's quite literally, it sends a signal to your brain where you thought, I'm going to die, like mm. impending doom. And that was so scary. I would say the main symptoms at that point were my breathing, I was really struggling, and my lower back pain. They were the two that I can remember really struggling with, having to think through my breathing. And what did it feel like? Them. Did it feel like your back, like was it tight or did it feel like someone was I, stabbing It you? felt like a stabbing pain like a stab. in the lower back, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was my whole body was cramping up as well. I just remember looking at my hand and my hand was just not moving at all. What about um, the actual area with the sting? It's funny because the actual area wasn't affected at all really. I mean, there was a weird sensation of sweating going on there. Yeah. It's the only part of my body that was sweating, but apart from that, um, it, it, the mark disappeared pretty quick and it was just left uh, left the rest of my body struggling. Just in so much pain. Mm. And James doesn't make a scene, so like when he was, you know, I could tell he was in a lot of pain. Would you say it's the most pain you've ever felt? Mm, for sure, yeah. Yeah, by a long way. Yeah, see it. A long way. And he, he's like a fit 22 year old. Well, I try. <laughs> try no, to be. but if it, if it happened to someone smaller, like I'm half your size, mm, half your weight. Yeah, it, it's a scary thought. Especially because there were children like in, in that area. And after the lifeguard, he was brilliant, our lifeguard. Mm, we, was, do, yeah. we do have to say that the whole lifeguard team in Cairns were fantastic. And it's nobody's fault that this happened, like it's nature, it's one of those things. Yeah, it's it's wrong place, wrong time. Um, someone there, well, one of the lifeguards suggested that it might have been um, swept in from the tide, from the winds, yeah. crept through somehow. Um, there's not a lot you can do about things like that. I think it's just made us realise how 
dangerous these small things can be. Yeah, literally. Um, so he shut the whole beach down um, and all the locals came like running out the water as soon as they heard the word Kanji, which told us everything. Um, and later that afternoon, um, they did a sweep of the net and they found three Irukandjis in that mm. netted area. So it's just a miracle that only James was stung. As soon as that happened, as soon as he found out sort of what it was, it was uh, briefing us that I'm going to have to be rushed to hospital and um, it's going to be a long night, I think. But, um, the, main, the main thing they look out for is to make sure that you don't go into cardiac arrest, have a heart attack, anything like that, because the venom makes your body work so hard to just sort of resist it and fight against it. I mean, the, uh, the, my blood pressure was through the roof. I can't remember the digits, but it was, it was something I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, they were mm. really concerned actually, and the, the ambulance had the lights on and it felt like an eternity, but they were probably there, I'd say maybe seven minutes it took. Yeah, and it was they, quick. Were, they were in Central Cairns, mm. so to get to Palm Cove, which is like a 25 minute drive, um, we had two ambulances arrive in the end and although it felt like an eternity, especially for you because mm. your chest was closing up it and does, yeah. you were in so much pain, they did arrive promptly. Um, we'll put some pictures up now. The backstory behind the pictures. We, I only started taking pictures when you had had this green whistle thing. Yeah, I was dosed up pretty quickly once they arrived on... Um, more. Then, well, that's why there's no pictures before they arrive because, yeah, because I was, uh, my main priority was not taking pictures. I was having like a full blown panic attack. I was like, oh down. my god, what? Like, I, I was so upset about the whole thing. Like, it's so distressing to see someone you care about go through that and not be able to do anything. Like, the, there was just nothing that we could do. We probably should note as well, there's no antidote for this venom. No, no it's, a, it's a case of monitoring how they're doing once they've been stung. Yeah. Um, I think the focus is heavily on preventing stings. Yeah, and the pain relief. And then, yeah, the pain relief, time. what you need, because they, yeah, they were constantly checking up on me, making sure that I had enough morphine and yeah. pain levels. And, and the morphine, that's, that's the reason I even have these photos and videos is James was hardly speaking before he got that green whistle um, and it, it must have been morphine in that green whistle do you think? Yeah I'm not sure what the green whistle you'll have to put we need a to description do some of what it is yeah, yeah I just know it's the green whistle the you'll see it you'll magic see it whistle that, that made me loopy as a <laughs> it took the pain away um, and it also made him shout take a picture take a picture take a video and this was the first time I'd heard him like speak normally since he'd been stung. Like I, so it was such a relief to me. I was like, okay, if he's asking me to take like a video or a picture, like he's, he, he's not gonna die, he's gonna be okay. Mm. And he would not shut up until I took one. Hence why we have these videos and pictures, which actually have proven really useful mm. um, because we were able to show like family and friends back home exactly. Yes, I think it's hard to, uh, to show them what state you're in and how you're doing yeah. at that time because I think, yeah, the, the conception of jellyfish isn't what it is in Australia. No. Um, so the paramedics arrived and what did they do as soon as they got there? Well, they, they hooked me up to, I think, every machine, up to ECGs and blood pressure and everything to go over vitals. Um, like I said, I don't think they could move me for a while because my blood pressure um, took the pain away, which was a relief for sure, um, and then eventually got me got me in the ambulance to yeah. to work on me a bit further while I was screaming videos and photos, please. And he was, and but even after all that morphine, and they were doing a brilliant job on you and keeping your pain down, you were still really complaining of the pain. Mm, yeah, yeah, with the amount of the amount of morphine that I've never been on morphine, so. The amount of morphine I was on, to still be complaining about my lower back was um, scary to look at, I think, in the future to look back on and think what pain I would have been in without them there and without the morphine. Yeah, I think if we'd left it much longer before getting oxygen and before the paramedics arrived with the morphine, I think you would have passed out. 
I think I was on the way too, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think breathing like that for a certain amount of time mm. always makes you sort of feel lightheaded and like you just need to pass out. Which is why it's so important if anyone is stung by anything, doesn't matter what, what it is, you tell someone straight away. Mm. Because James could have, you know, it could have come on a lot quicker and well, a lot he more said, severe for you and you could have blacked out. Mm, he said half an hour they're known to um, go into cardiac arrest. Yeah, and we wouldn't have known And you can die of a heart well. attack within 30 minutes, yeah. So, they finally got you in the ambulance where they had some AC as well, thank God, because that didn't help. Like, it sounds a bit pathetic, but it really was very hot. Cairns were going through a heat wave at the time, and it was 37 degrees yes, yeah, on the day that James was stung, and, like, we were struggling. The air was it just felt so thin. Um, so when we could get in the ambulance with the AC, that was a relief. Um, then it was a drive to Cairns Hospital, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what did they do with you from there? Because of COVID, I was kind you weren't of allowed in, were you? shunned away, which was sad and upsetting and stressful. But that's that's COVID at the moment, isn't it? Um, but you were well looked after, weren't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. So I think after that 10 hours, um, I stumbled out of the hospital feeling a bit, bit rough, where you were at the Airbnb, weren't you? Uh, waiting. waiting. So I jumped in the Uber and went back. Um, crashed, I think. I was waiting with a Pizza Hut. But you, you were, didn't yeah. Really like eating, yeah. Did you? You didn't eat for a couple of days. No, no. I mean, it, it did look nice. Um, I could do, I could do it one now, but you know, um, at the time, you look at it and you just, you just feel like sleeping. I think. Um, and you still kind of had that feeling of like anxiety and impending doom a bit for a couple of days after I would say. I think it was the um, just the chest pains that just get a bit worrying. Yeah, so so you, you slept fine that day, mm. that evening, and then it came to the fifth, so the day after. Um, and we were keeping it really like chilled the whole day. Like the doctor had said to James, don't expect to be able to do the 10K run. Yeah. Um, but we were just staying in bed, like I was getting you like tiny pieces of toast and bits of water. Yeah. And then it got to about 6 p.m. the following evening and your chest went again, didn't it? Yeah, I was having minor chest pains, um, tightness in the chest, which I think to them was a big red flag. Because, um, I mean, you called the hospital to see what you could do, but I think they suggested just it needs to be looked at. And you were also getting like, was it tingling or something in your arm? Yeah, yeah, across the across my whole body, um, there'd be sort of tingling pains, and I think that was the the venom sort of in the bloodstream. Hadn't fully gone yeah. out of your system. Yeah, out of my system. No, no. So um, after that, it wasn't long till I was back in hospital again um, for more more tests and X-rays, which was amazing of them to do. Um, yeah, they're brilliant. And that did come up with uh, the diagnosis of Irukandji syndrome, um, which is what I had from the Irukandji sting, like ironically. Yeah, it's a it's a great name. Kind of tells you everything you need to know. It's definitely an Irukandji. Uh, we'll list actually the symptoms of Irukandji syndrome mm. up here, and James experienced every single one. Pretty I much, think so. Yeah, you? I think most of them. Yeah, yeah, because the. Um, the venom, once it entered my body, made its way into my heart, um, which caused it to be extremely fast. And with it pumping all that blood in and out so quickly, it caused part of it to, to have a mild leak from there. So um, it sounds scary when he first told me, I think I did panic a bit, but after well, he reassured me. Well, someone tells you a little piece of your heart has come off because a venom has got into it, of course you're gonna like freak mm. out. That is so scary. Well, I think after he reassured me that there'd be no lasting damage. Yeah, that's the thing. And the size of it in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, he said you'd make a full recovery, that you're a fit, healthy young person and your heart touch wood should be totally fine, mm, unaffected I think I've made, yeah. in the future. I think I'm fully fit and fighting now, I think. So, it's five weeks on, mm -hmm. how are you feeling, how did you feel 
a day after? How did you feel a week after? How do you feel now? Well, the day after, I was struggling, hence why I went back into hospital. Um, and that took a while just to sort of catch my breath, I think, each each time just I did anything. Just walking up and yeah. down the stairs in the Airbnb was a bit much mm. for you, wasn't it? I think after a week, I was definitely feeling a lot better because we were still in Australia, so able to do activities and stuff. And yeah, we kind of thought, because we were both scared, like I, I wasn't stung, but I could well have been, and we were both kind of really anxious of the sea and we're we're good swimmers you know like we love being out and we love being in the ocean mm -hmm. and we thought it would be such a shame to let this put us off for good definitely yeah i think also the further south we went we knew from our research that it got a lot safer in the water yeah um so we did however though i think it was a week after you'd been stung we did a great barrier reef tour mm, yeah yeah, as we were fully suited up in stinger suits, um, so that made us feel a lot more at ease. Yeah, basically stinger suits are these like, gosh. You'll put a picture of it on there, and you can see. Yeah, they're like these. Like a morph suit. Like a morph really. suit, and they cover everything up from like here all the way down to there, and then you have your snorkel on, so stingers can't get you. Yeah. Basically. Well, yeah, they they don't. They don't penetrate through that, so the stings don't. And don't after, after obviously we'd been through this, we then did our research, and they recommend that you wear stinger suits if you were to go in the ocean in Cairns between November and May. Well, we didn't even realise that they had a stinger season. They called it, did they? Until no, it's just until crazy. after yeah, yeah. The things that we didn't know. But um, but I'd say after after a month, it's definitely been um been a journey but made a couple of headlines yeah <laughs> yeah local papers and and whatnot it's um well and national papers as well to be fair but yeah here you go you can see all the screen clippings and shots of all the papers that reported on yeah yeah Tom who got stung <laughs> yeah but um definitely definitely back to fully fit now back to the gym and Back to running. Yeah, and it didn't ruin the holiday for me personally. No, not not for me either. I think I think it was high. It was a dent on on a great holiday yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And it's a great story, obviously. So. It's a great story to to tell. Just pretty scary when you're in the middle of it. Mm, for sure. Well. That concludes the story time of the Irukandji Sting. Um, feel free to ask you know, questions down below if you have any questions and James will answer them. I'm not really qualified. Um, and if anyone's interested, we could do another kind of Q&A video or go into you know different aspects of just the whole experience really in the aftermath and yeah. you know what's gone on. But we would like to give a huge shout out to just the medical teams that, that helped. 100%. Because oh, yeah. they saved you, didn't yeah, they? They were, they were amazing. Amazing. I mean, they definitely don't get enough credit, you know, when you you can never say how grateful you are enough. Yeah. When they when they do such a great job and so friendly and even we were saying on the second night, I'm so sorry, I felt I felt silly thinking that I don't need to go into hospital and wasting their time but they were so nice and so understanding and yeah they were just they were just amazing yeah so we will be back australia don't worry it's definitely not put us off mm -hmm. at all i've got to do my skydive yeah that's the only thing you missed out it's the on. one thing one thing but i think i had enough adrenaline pumping through my body enough to kill a horse so i think uh i think we'll save this skydive until next the time next trip yeah <laughs> Okay, well hopefully no more stinger incidents to be reported on, so we'll sign off now. Thank you so much for watching this video.